morning, everyone. Welcome to The Broad Perspective here on The Broad Perspective Network. We're glad you're with us today. My name is Vivian Kamori. And I'm Katie Curley Nelson. And we're going to be joined after our first commercial break by a gentleman with the name of Joe Dolishall. And he's going to be talking to us about the Upanishads. It's going to be very interesting. And Western mysticism. Yeah. I, I've just been doing some research on this subject, and I've been learning quite a bit. Because, you know, honestly, I'd heard the word and had no clue, <laughs> no clue really what it was. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. Well, we're going to find out. Yeah, we're going to learn quite a bit, I am sure. And, you know, Katie and I both like learning things, so. Absolutely. Yeah. And this is a subject I love, so that'll be great. See, and you're, you're so much more versed in this than I am, so, yeah, I'll It'll just kind of sit back and listen to you. Yeah, from he's what I understand, a, just a very a scholar, very so, knowledgeable yeah. young man. Mm -hmm. He's already on the road to doing great and wondrous things, I do believe. So we're going to have fun visiting with him. He's a great guy, too. Definitely. Yeah. And so do we have any announcements or anything, Katie? I don't think we do, do we? Um, I don't think coming up yeah. right away. Everybody's just getting ready for the holidays. So recovering yeah. from Turkey. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's true. And we hope everybody has Turkey a out. great holiday. Mm-hmm. And so we were talking before we came on the air about what we were going to do on our Broaden Your Horizon segment. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we draw cards that kind of stimulate our, our, our brains and, and we can figure out what we want to talk about. Today we came in because we had some experiences and some purpose. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to talk a little bit, what was it, about fear? Fear. Yeah. Uh, maybe not just fear, but also delusion yeah oh that's a good one so and maybe the combination of the two and how they interact with one another right and one of the things that katie and i've been talking a lot if you listen to this show regularly is we've been talking a lot about knowing who you are mm -hmm. and it's it's my contention anyway and i think that katie is, is in agreement with this that most people don't know who they are they think they do mm-hmm and they define themselves by all the externals and what they have and what they've accomplished. And the reality is that's really not who they are at all. And people don't really give it that much thought. They don't really go into that introspection to find out why they react certain ways, why, who, why they behave in certain ways, mm -hmm. and, and what's the root cause of who they are. That'll tell, that tells you a lot about who you are. I think sometimes you have a certain perception of yourself. Right. Or a perception of what others think of you. Yes. And that perception is not always reality. No, it's not. It's, 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 you know, we've got the iceberg, and that's 15% above the water. Mm -hmm. And then we've got that underneath the iceberg, which is 85% right. of that ice is underneath the surface. And that's who our consciousness is, is that 85% that's under the surface mm -hmm. that even we ourselves don't know. And I know that there are lots of scholars who have devoted their entire lives to knowing who they are. St. Ignatius, I know, is one of them, okay. has really devoted his life to, to understanding the depths of who he was. For instance, and one of the examples uh, Katie and I in our conversation had talked about, say, for instance, you're super jealous. Your husband's flirting, flirting with another gal, mm -hmm. and you're really jealous. Well, it's obvious you're jealous, but why? Where what, is what's that under, jealousy, where's coming, that jealousy from? coming from? Mm -hmm. What's underneath the surface mm -hmm. of that? Why, why are you experiencing that emotion? Because there's something underneath. There's a root cause. There's a root cause, mm -hmm. and that's what most people don't stop and think about. They're going mm -hmm. to blame that person for something. They're going to say, or blame well, the person they're flirting with or whoever. Exactly. It's they're, always externally they're blaming. They're not turning it in on themselves and looking internally right. at what the real issue is. Right. And that's, that is, a, last week, Katie and I talked about maturity. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And this just plays right into that because that is really a huge level of maturity. Mm -hmm. Maturity is really about that intrinsic knowledge of knowing who you are. And that in turn affects how you react to that exactly. situation. Exactly. So when you're faced with something, you may or may, may not react differently. However, when you can acknowledge why you've reacted mm -hmm. that way and who you are that behaves in that way, that's huge. That's a huge manifestation of maturity. Now, how does someone go about knowing their self? It takes time to pause and reflect. One of the things that also in our conversation earlier, I was mentioning, I 
was at a meeting today and I, I heard someone say, well, they have to be real careful and guard what they let into their minds because it affects their being. And so they, because they want to always be positive. They mm -hmm. want to always think positive and always keep that mental attitude. And I vehemently disagree with that because if you cannot observe no matter what it is, anything and be okay with whatever it is, then you are not being real with who you are mm -hmm. because you should be able to deal with anything and maintain balance with who you are. That's not easy. No, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. But it's paying, that is paying attention. Like say if I watch the news tonight, there mm -hmm. are things on there that might disturb me, but do they change my vibration? Okay, that's good. That's Indicated. the main thing. Do any of these things change your vibration? And if they do, then you're not, then your vibration isn't where you think it is. Or that vulnerability to whatever it is that you're viewing, maybe you need to look closer in depth on that. Right. Where like if you're watching movies or watching, you know, mm -hmm. whatever, documentaries on something, and there's a certain um, theme, like right. let's say, you know, every time you see the father-daughter thing, then that theme, you know, it gets to you. Well, there's a reason. Is there an issue between you and your father, or right. the, you know, that relationship? So right. certain, um, I guess, triggers right. that you can see, if you can see that certain pattern of certain triggers, then that's one time you should really turn inside and say, okay, maybe there's some unresolved issues here that I have that I need to focus exactly. on. Exactly. That's what helps you understand who you are. Mm -hmm. If these things are disturbing you, yeah, you don't want that disturbance, but you also need to pay attention to why. Mm -hmm. It's because you're uncomfortable. Maybe you feel uncertain that you have any power over it. Maybe you're, that bothers you. Maybe you mm -hmm. think you need power to control world hunger. I don't know. <laughs> but but there's, there is a reason for everything. And your primary vibration, truly, mm -hmm. your primary vibration in a perfect world should be able to be a part of everything and yet not be a part of anything. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. And so that's when it gets really deep. That's when it gets mm -hmm. very, very deep. And as you watch people and their behaviors, I'm of the oh so judgmental opinion that most people are not aware of who they are. And oh, and yeah, I think you're right on that. And how they behave, they're not they're just not really aware because it's not in sync. So we all have we all have lots to learn in the process, myself included. That's, right. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> no, and we're all learning. And that's right. the thing is, if you are open enough to try and learn and be aware of the triggers mm -hmm. and be aware of the patterns that you see in your life and be able to focus on them and work on them, that's a step. That's right. a step in the right direction. If you're delusional and you live in this fantasy world where you're not even going to recognize it's always somebody else's fault, it's always somebody else's issue, you're right. never, ever, ever going to know yourself, ever. Right. And you're not going to be any different, right? any better, any worse. You can learn to play the game, and people yes. do, and they learn to, they <laughs> pretend all day long. Oh, yes. But um, the truth is in there, and the truth is within you. Right. And you're the only one that can turn around and find it. And that's the key to everything. Right there. So we'll ask Joseph when we talk to him in just a few minutes to expound on that, because I think he's going to have some insights on that. Oh, absolutely. I don't know what the Upanishads speak to as far as our subject matter, but my guess mm -hmm. is they probably have a lot to say. I would think so. They yeah. wouldn't have lasted this long if they I, didn't, that's right? That's very true, <laughs> exactly. Because I think that's the repetitive theme throughout all mankind's history. You know, Know mm -hmm. Thyself was mm -hmm. written above the, the uh, doorway at the Temple of Delphi back in ancient Greece. That's been, uh, knowing who you are has been a key factor in everything and so we, we, we keep aspiring to things that make sense in some ways. And then they, then again, when we look at the key and core issues, we really still aren't getting it. And I, th that my, in my mm -hmm. oh so humble opinion, it is time for us to wake up mm -hmm. to the fact that we don't know who we are. We think we do and we don't. I think there's a lot of purposeful distractions though. Yes. You know yeah, what I purposeful, mean? Purposeful, well said, yeah. I think there's distractions that keep us from maybe wanting to or, right. I mean, it's easy to just sit in front of the TV and veg out mm -hmm. and not really right. think about those things. There's right. there's times to relax and there's times to do that. Right. But I think it's important that we take a little bit of time to do a little bit of inward reflection. Reflection, there you go. Yeah, you're right. So it's time. So that's our challenge to our listeners today. Take some time, do some inward reflection. 
and see what you can find out about yourself. I've had to do that in the last few years. I've spent some, oh my gosh, some really, um, I'm going to say painful times too. Mm-hmm. To take a look. Do you ever stop, though? I mean, no, I we think never it's do. An I think that's part process. of our process, mm-hmm. but it is. It does make us a different person, and I'd like to think a better person, but that's subjective too. So <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. So we're going to be back in just a few minutes. Stay tuned, and we'll be visiting with Joe Dolishal, and we're looking forward to this. The Upanishads and Western mysticism. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. ever wake up and ask yourself what's really going on in the world you live in it's time for you to be aware it's the number one alternative website on the planet truth is scary.com daily stories log on daily to get the latest information on the stories that radio and tv wouldn't dare to cover experience our curriculum with over 20 topics from government conspiracies and extraterrestrials to meditation and nutrition celebrity interviews watch exclusive videos with your favorite celebrities and find out what their alternative views are it's your source for the information you won't find in the mainstream media it's truth is scary.com log on today and be aware truth is scary.com Welcome back to The Broad Perspective here on The Broad Perspective Network. I'm Vivian Kamori. And I'm Katie Curley Nelson. And we are getting ready to visit with Joe Dolishal. And he is going to be talking to us about the Upanishads. I hope I said that right, Joe. Upanishads, close enough. (laughs) Upanishads. I'm I'm getting your name down, Pat, and then I'm I'm struggling with that word. And we're also going to talk about Western mysticism. And, And, Joe, we're so glad you're with us today because this is a subject that I really, I've heard the word over time, even though I still don't know how to pronounce it well. I have heard it. Mm -hmm. I just don't know that much about it. And I've been doing my homework, and I've learned a lot, and I find it quite fascinating. So I'm really looking forward to our chat because Mm -hmm. I think this information is going to be quite valuable. How in the world did you ever just take an interest in this? Well, um, it's actually kind of a long story. I I initially started as a math and physics major when I was was still in my late teens. Um, And the book that inspired me was actually Brian Greene's The Elegant Universe. That's kind of... Believe oh, yeah. it or not, what what inspired me into this whole, I guess, occult mysticism, uh, supernatural, psychic field, and because I, I at the time, you know, of course, I didn't know much about anything, so I just naturally assumed that the sciences had the answer to everything. Um, so, you know, later on, to my dismay, unfortunately, I realized that it doesn't, or at least it's not publicly mm-hmm. disclosed. So, I started veering a little bit more towards, I guess, what we can dub as the esoteric or spiritual dynamic of of humanity. Um, my first dabbling into it was was many years ago when I actually read a book that I randomly came across called uh, Thought Power by a uh, Swami Shivananda, and mm. and um, it, essentially that was really the gateway book that led me into all these dynamic um, spiritual concepts like Kundalini Yoga, like Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, various spiritual and religious experiences, and. You know, one thing led to another, and then before you knew it, I really got heavily, heavily involved in what we call the Upanishads. Um, that's kind of, you know, what we're discussing today, but that's actually mm-hmm. one of my most favorite subjects and has been for many years now. And, um, yeah, you know, the, the Upanishads essentially are uh, commentaries, if you will, on what are called the Rig Vedas. Um, the Rig Vedas are essentially like the Eastern, I want to say Hindu, but that would be technically inappropriate to call it Hindu, um, more about its Brahmanic literature from the Brahmins, and it's like their Bible is what it is. It essentially talks about the creation of the universe, the creation of the human race, the um, the, the, the dilemma of the human conflict, if you will, and it just goes, it's basically like the Bible of the East, you know, it's probably the most oldest literature that, that at least is currently available on record. And the Upanishads are essentially mystical commentaries on the whole subject. And, you know, they can range anywhere from just dealing with um, psychological phenomenon, from the phenomenon of perception, uh, you know, dealing with the body and whatnot. And also it goes very deep into the mystical aspects of things in terms of uh, magic, meditation, reflection, contemplation, and really the whole gamut 
of the human experience, and it's it's tr truly fascinating literature. I, I think it is, and for what I have deduced, and part of what you said too, this these texts were written before the time of Christ, before the time of Buddha, mm -hmm. and we had talked, or we had discussed before we came on the air about whether or not they existed before the Sumerian text or for any Egyptian hieroglyphics, the timeline mm -hmm. there. I find that all quite fascinating. I'd like for you to speak to that, and then I want to come, talk to, come back and talk about creation and the dilemma, dilemma of humanity. So uh, first of all, the timeline. What, what have you discovered as far as the timeline goes? In terms of the timeline, it's, it's very interesting. You know, they, it is even admitted today as, as even um, conservative estimates that the Rig Vedas have their root anywhere from six, seven to 8,000 years old. That's, what it, that's what's actually admitted today. Um, realistically, it's probably much older than that. I would speculate that it, it, predates, um, it predates this human era, this human epic, if you will, meaning that I feel that the human race goes through cycles of 7,000 years where it essentially something might happen or they maybe kill each other off and then a few remain and then they start all over. It's a, it's a new process. And so I feel that the Rig Vedas de uh, predate um, this human epic era, which I think started around 4,000 B.C. again. Um, so that's kind so, of when we started over. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, we start over say. into where we are now, and yeah. we'll come back to that timeline in just a little bit. So what do they say about creation? What is creation all about in, in the text? What do they reveal? Well, it's, it, it's essentially something... I guess it's pretty it's pretty difficult to understand in terms of just just spewing off a few sentences because it's something that you truly have to read several times over and you kind of have to meditate on it because it becomes more it becomes more of a intuitive abstraction of understanding rather than a psychological something you can articulate in words you know mm -hmm. um, and and what's ironic is you know when you get to the meaning of you know the bottom line of each of these even the Bible even the you know the Old Testament it all talks about the same thing in the beginning there was one without a second and then something happened where it split the two and this certain bifurcation happened which is essentially the initiation of our universe um, hmm. And so, and so, in terms of the beginning, it, it it it's interesting because it doesn't really elaborate so much on a beginning as such. It does talk about, you know, in the beginning there was just essentially one a, a whole, and then things started bifurcating, started becoming dual in that perspective. Now, it it wasn't so much a question of that that was the absolute beginning and there was nothing before that because it does even refer to parallel universes. It does refer wow. to infinite universes, and. So, you know, for all we know, our universe could just be one of an infinite amount of universes. You've probably seen movies that were like that. Right. So, so in terms of the beginning um, of the Upanishads, it's really, it talks about essentially that we come as a human race from a very, very long, very, very long timeline. You know, that the human race actually stretches back hundreds of thousands of years and in some cases millions of years. And according to, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Yugas, you know, right now we're currently in the Kali Yuga stage. Yes. And this is basically the most degenerate phase that the human race will experience in a very long time, that we were in point, in fact, gods at one point. You know, we could levitate, we could meditate, we could um, not, excuse me, not meditate, but rather levitate, um, um, teleportation, any kind of teleportation, telekinesis, moving things with just the mind, thought stuff was all a very real possibility, even up until relatively recently, about 20,000 years ago. And because of the influence of the stars then the human race can do nothing but really kind of go with it um, and and the result of that is really just a type of human degeneration now it's not really all doom and gloom because the objective is a type of purification you know it, it's right. kind of the, the ebb and flow of the universe and the end result is to actually purify the entire human race over an extremely vast time cycle it doesn't happen in you know a couple hundred years a couple thousand years we're thinking more along the lines of hundreds of thousands if not millions of years actually Wow. Yeah, so where so, are we at in that cycle now? Right now we're in um, we're in Kali Yuga, which according to the twenty six thousand or twenty five thousand four hundred fifty um, cycle year, because that's actually what it's even in, in Western mysticism considered the procession of the equinox. Then we are um, we are actually bouncing back from the low point. The low point was supposed to be sometime in the fourteenth century. Um, so out of that twenty five thousand year cycle, we're actually bouncing back up from that twenty five. Uh, thousand year cycle now within the twenty five thousand year cycles there's even subsections of four uh, four 
um, four units or, or quarters where they're actually broken down into 7,000 year cycles, which is exactly what I was talking about earlier. And even the Bible refers to it in terms mm-hmm. of the 7,000 year cycles where we go through. And that's actually where we even get the seven days of the week because it's supposed to represent mm-hmm. a completion of, uh, of cycles. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so right now at this particular phase, this epic, we're actually in the 6,000th year, which is you know ironic because if, if, if uh, your audience is uh, um, uh, attuned to uh, biblical history or what would have yes. been considered as orthodox biblical history, then they always say that the world started in around 4,000 BC plus or minus. Well, they're not talking right. about the physical world, obviously, because dinosaurs, they're talking about, it's, it's a mistranslation. They're referring to this specific age in the human development start around 4,000 BC, which would exactly correspond to the seven thousand year theory wow that's interesting. yeah and then there's that uh, in revelation the thousand year reign of christ there's the right. six thousand years and then there's that remaining thousand that constitutes the seven thousand years right and there's that uh so are we heading into that thousand right. coming out I of that think, thousand i think we are i think what i think you know and this is just my personal opinion from what i know about how the banking laws work because even you know even legal common law and even banking mm-hmm. law the reason they're so successful is because believe it or not they actually abide by spiritual principles quite rigidly and that's why they're so successful in what they are despite the fact that people think they're doing very um, i guess immoral and and corrupt things right. um but you know to not stretch out an extremely long discussion i think that we're going to see probably maybe another 70 years of turmoil um from 2001 and i think it's going to go about another 70 years so sometime in the year 2070s when it's going to pretty much climax that it's very very worst and then after that it'll get much better i don't think i don't, i'm not 100% sure that we'll actually see that uh, thousand year reign but it will come i just don't you know because you know because of the way that the banking institutes um they institute and implement certain debt crises on the people. It actually happens in 70-year cycles. I don't know how familiar you guys are with the subject, but not to uh, diverge. Somewhat, yes. Yeah, not to diverge too much. Um, you know, essentially, they, you know, they were uh, the United States corporation that was located in a country called America was actually established mm-hmm. in you know 1860, um, 1864, I believe it was, and then you know 70 years forward we have 1933, which was the establishment of the Federal Reserve, and then you know fast forward 70 years we get basically um, the implementation of um, the Patriot Act, which nullifies a lot of the old Americas, which was a result of 9/11. So it's you know, and even the Twin Towers was a very symbolic process of destroying the old ways of order, the duality of such, and creating a one-world government. And, and that goes more into the Kabbalah and stuff like that. But, um, you know, as, as sinister as these things are, they really do abide very strictly by spiritual principles, and that's why they're so successful. But, but. It's funny you would say that, because one of the things I've noticed, and in honesty, my whole life, I've never given much thought or value to the importance of contracts. Mm-hmm. But I am getting the opinion that that is an intention of all beings earthly or otherwise that there is something about contractual law Mm -hmm. oh yeah oh yeah well contract law actually comes um, contract law is obviously it's uh, emanation from common law but all common law emanates from canon law which is the spiritual law essentially and the reason was for that is because I guess there was some kind of an agreement in the 16th, 17th century that uh, spirituality was going to become in certain respects defunct and rather than trying to imbue mo- the, the human race with the things they couldn't understand like spirituality because most people just don't care or they think it's superstition then they just try to rationalize it via the intellect which is really the basis of the intellectual renaissance that we had in the 16th, 17th century and they just made everything more mind based which is the result of common law but common law is 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 part and parcel of uh, canon law it just doesn't have that spiritual dynamic behind it it doesn't have the spiritual justification behind it if you will um so but but absolutely i mean uh, everything that you do, you know, when, when, like right now, we're even, we, we basically established a contract by going on this radio station. Right. Uh, because, you know, may not, might not have been written, but there's this tacit agreement that we're going to do something and we're going to execute something. And when you don't do it, then, you know, you essentially undermine your character. Then people don't want to deal with you. But it also has something to do with the cosmos as such because you're not, I think, you're not fulfilling your karmic obligation that you made prior to coming into this body. That's my personal opinion. I like what you're saying there, and I find it quite interesting. So, in other words, your word is your bond still does have huge credence and value. 
Absolutely. And, and I mean, you can, you know, like I always say, it's easy to fool people, but it's uh, impossible to fool God. So, you know, if, if you back down on deals and eventually it'll reflect and then people just won't intuitively want to deal with you, even if they don't know why, you know. Ah. So, I mean, you know, even the Holocaust, did you guys know, like, for example, the Holocaust actually means a sacrificial burning? Did you know that? No. Yeah, that's not. what the, the word actually means, that sacrificial burning, because, um, you know, and that's that's another subject, but I'll just lightly touch up on it. It, it, it. There's a book called uh, Wall Street and the Rise of Hitler, and it turns out that, you know, granted that there was like Henry Ford and IBM that were behind Adolf Hitler, um, the number one financiers of Adolf Hitler the entire time were actually Jewish Zionists on Wall Street. Yes. Yes. And and the reason they wanted that, you know, people would say, well, why would, you know, why would Jews want to fund their own sacrifice? Well, that's exactly the point. Sacrifice is probably one of the most important spiritual principles um, that are known, you know. And I mean, the, the Bible is flooded with these kind of uh, examples where, you know, they say sacrifice is the measure of credibility. Wow. If you, yeah, if you want something, then sacrifice something which is extremely valuable to you for the gods, as it were. And prove to God that your, you know, what your what your intentions are and what your interests are truly have merit, and you're not just saying something for the sake of talking. And God will grant you that thing. Well, you know, what have Jews wanted for, you know, at least two thousand years? You know, their own land. Through, their I'm own afraid. land, exactly. Yeah. And so it turns out that you know the word Holocaust. When you look it up, look it up in you know dictionary.com, mm -hmm. and it and the word Holocaust means literally a sacrificial burning. Um, you know, sacrifice as in sacrifice to the gods and burning, you know, you see like Adolf uh, or Schindler's List example, um, you know, where there's that prominent scene where, you know, the, the Jewish individual is walking down the street and then the ashes start falling down on them. It's kind of like Hollywood's telling you something, you know, you just have to learn bet uh, to read between the lines. Yeah. So it's, you know, and, and that's why I say, you know, uh, these people that rule the world, they might be by all means corrupt, immoral, and psychotic from our perspective, and they are, but... They do, I think, vehemently abide by uh, spiritual principles, which is the probably the number one reason they're so successful, because they understand how the laws work. I'm not talking about uh, government law. I'm not talking about corporate law. I'm talking about God's law, about how spiritual contractual things work, you know, a tit for tat with the universe, if you will. Now, how would you define these people that run what's going on? I, I don't think... Um, in, you know, I, I don't think they're government. I think they work through government. I think they implement the government, you know, kind of like the priesthood of the Illies things. They're essentially people behind the scenes. I don't even think it's the Pope. You know, like the Vatican is actually a corporation. I don't know if you guys know that. It's right, not. Yeah. 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 And, and so with that said, it's like it's, you know, like even the Federal Reserve. Bernanke has nothing to do with the ownership of the money there. He's a manager. That's it. He's just mm -hmm. a spokesman for the Federal Reserve. But who actually owns it? You know, even if we say, oh, OK, well, the Bank of America, Chase. Um, you know, and we just mm -hmm. start going down the Wahlbergs, whatnot. Well, that's fine, but who are those individuals? Nobody can really put a face with a name. I personally think it's the kings of Europe that basically went under in the 1900s. They created corporate bodies, and everything just became business, and it lost its spiritual touch. That's who I personally think it is. I think it's just very prominent kings. Um, that's who's controlling things right now? In terms of the finances, yes. And okay. I would say that they essentially use a type of black magic to control it. I honestly think it's black magic. I think it's very, very astute and a keen understanding mm -hmm. of the electromagnetic life force. Mm -hmm. I think they understand sacrifice. I think they understand spiritual principle. I think they're even in communion, what we would quote unquote call the gods. You know, of course, there's many gods, there's not one god. Mm -hmm. um, and even it's interesting, you know, I looked at what the word queen means. And did you, did you know what the word queen actually means a prostitute to a king? Did you know that? <laughs> No, I, no. I looked up the etymological dictionary, the etymological definition of a queen, because I always wondered to myself, you know, anybody who's done any substantial research, and I won't go into it too much now, knows that so much of this filth and degeneration comes out of England, um, mm -hmm. you know, the British Empire. And I always thought to myself, well, could it really be that, you know, the queen, this, you know, a 70, 80 year old lady who's doing all these things? Because obviously, you know, it's not really. You know, power and greed and corruption really isn't concomitant with a woman's thought, and it really historically never has been. I mean, of course, they have that dynamic, but that's always been kind of a man's thing, you know. Uh -huh. And so I thought to myself, and I'm like, well, what is a queen? Because we always see the queen, but where's the king? Nobody, ever, you know, we haven't mm -hmm. seen the king since the 1902, I think it was, or maybe the 1950s. Right. Um, 
And so, yeah, it turns out that, you know, a queen, by definition, is actually the king's prostitute, somebody who stands in front of something which the king represents, which is funny. That's what the word queen actually means. I didn't know that. So I would say, oh, that, that makes sense that the powers once again are behind, but nobody ever sees these powers. And, you know, you would have somebody standing in place of the power, kind of like the pope is the vicar of Christ, even though he's not Christ, you know. He would be the pimp then. <laughs> Essentially, right? <laughs> Essentially. So, well, on that, we're going to have to take a commercial break. Let's pick this up when we come back. We'll be back in a, just a minute with more of the broad perspective and our visit with Joseph Dolezal. Dolezal. There. <laughs> It appears we may be living in turbulent times. Are you prepared? Find out. Go to www.72hours.com. That's www72, the number 72hours.com. For more information on home safety, pet safety, water, resources, training, and community support. We can always hope for the best, but it's good to be prepared for the worst. Get involved. Get ready. Get informed. Go to www.72hours.com for more information. This is brought to you by The Broad Perspective, a public service announcement. Welcome back to The Broad Perspective here on The Broad Perspective Network. I'm Vivian Kamori. And I'm Katie Curley Nelson. And we are visiting with Joseph Dolashal. Dolashal. Yep. <laughs> Joe. Joe. Right. We're visiting with Joe. Joe. That's better. Joe, Joe of the Pyramid Center. Just try that. Joe of the Pyramid Center. Joe of the, Pyra- oh, the yeah. Pyramid Center. I wanted to talk oh, about that. We do want to too. talk about that. We're going to, come, we're going to do that on our last segment because that's phenom- what you're doing there is phenomenal. But let's go back to this information about the queen and the king and all that. I just read an article just uh, this week about the queen is a direct blood lineage to the Caesars in Rome. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I don't think a lot of people are aware of that. Right. That this this ruling elite has descended from at least from that timeline, and I don't know what was prior to that, but there is there is definitely a corne- correlation correlation, yeah. correlation between Rome and the throne in England. Right. Well, we you know we definitely in in today's terms, our entire social structure is based a hundred percent on on what was of ancient Rome, you know, and even in terms of the money, um, you know, there was a saying that we essentially have a you know we have Jewish law. We have a Roman form of government and a Greek lifestyle. That's actually, you know, Greek, Greek culture. <laughs> That's kind perfect. of like where, where the three aspects of our modern culture come from. But the Rome, uh, Roman obviously has the most um, prominent influence because even, you know, e- everything is run through um, – like the Vatican, essentially, where you have the Caesar, the Caesar of the time was essentially God on earth, which is what we right. Pope is mm-hmm. supposed to represent the God on earth today in the Vatican. And these these bloodlines that you're referring to, there's actually 12 of them specifically, which, yes. you know, which correspond to the 12 tribes of Israel and then the 12 constellations. And mm-hmm. um, ironically, if you look on the back of the dollar where you see the Jewish star, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, you see the six pointed hexagram, mm-hmm. which is, you know, uh, the, um, the two triangles interlaced, there's 12 stars on that, probably most likely represent presenting the 12 uh, families that run the world. Um, and is these that were, related at all to, like, the Illuminati? I think it is. You know, the Illuminati is a very, very, um, very ambiguous, I guess if you want to call it a fraternity, because there's been a lot of speculation. Of course, David Icke talks about it, you know, and of course right. uh, Jordan Maxwell talks about it, and there's a tremendous amount of people who speculate on it. But see, the entire concept of the Illuminati, the individual that made that concept public was an individual named Myron Fagan. He was a, a Jewish screenwriter in the 1960s, mm-hmm. and he was about to pass away, and I believe it was 1967 where he actually came out with an LP record, which was just an audio recording, just him talking. He was about, he was about two years before he died, and I guess he had... Um, very prominent connections to these individuals, the Illuminati, because he just starts talking about everything, what their objective was, how they were going to do it, what they were going to do, how they were going to execute it. But he never said who, and he never really pointed his finger at it. He never, he never even insinuated that he would either be a king or a pope or if they were maybe just individuals behind the scene that worked within government. Um, 
So the real and true nature of these individuals we call Illuminati is elusive. Nobody really knows who they are, even though some people will say it's the Bilderbergs or, you know, or, or it's the Warburgs or it's these Jewish Zionists or, you know, it's members of the uh, Vatican. You know, the truth is nobody really knows. It's all speculation, which is entirely based off of Myron Fagan's Illuminati excerpt, which you can actually um, hear on YouTube if you just Google search or even YouTube search Myron Fagan Illuminati. You can listen to the whole nine-part series for free on YouTube. Um, and that's really what everybody, every single person, big or small today, bases their um, rationale off what the Illuminati is. You know, there was individuals like Albert Pike that made it public back in even 1870, but nobody really gave it any heed or attention. So, I mean, they, they do go very far back. That is true. They are very powerful. That is true. Who they are, um, if they're just, if they're an elite part of the government or if they work absolutely in secrecy where nobody even knows who they are it's it's truly a mystery um you know and and then the other question is also you know even like individuals like albert pike refer to julius caesar as being an illuminati so you know these these this concept of illuminati could even far 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 predate um you know the 1776 adam weishaupt revolution so it's that's that in itself is a very technical subject you know where how far you want to get into it and and ultimately like i said at least nobody's ever been public with it who they are and i and they're not presidents i don't there are freemasons who are presidents mm -hmm. and there's very yes. powerful people and judges that are freemasons but freemasonry itself it's just uh it's like it, it's a cast type it's like saying a president okay but you're a president of what you know of, of right. are you president of Hungary, the United States? So if you're a Freemason, you're a Freemason of what? You know, the Grand Lodge of England, mm -hmm. the OTO, the Illuminati, you know. So Freemasonry is just a general term. That doesn't mean you're a good or a bad person. That just right. means you're part of a fraternity. That's all that means. Um, so that's, like I said, it's a pretty dynamic depth subject, but um, I don't know how much time you have. Maybe we should delve into the Upanishads instead. <laughs> yeah, we should probably come back to that. But I do, I, I do want to say that I do think that some of that's going to be revealed in our lifetime, or I should say my lifetime, because I'm mm -hmm. quite a bit older than you are. Mm -hmm. And I just have that feeling that at least there is going to be some sort of revelation yeah. for some of us. And I and I know that there's a book being written right now by someone who is uh, greatly in the know that we've interviewed, uh, revealing some of the Illuminati members, and I'll disclose that uh, at another time, but I've seen excerpts from the book, it's pretty profound. And so, anyway, I can only hope, I hope that I can live long enough to have see something exciting. You know? <laughs> can always come back again, Viv. Okay, right. I, yeah, yeah, but I'll, <laughs> I'll forget. I can't remember anything now, you know, why would I remember it then? So, right. anyway, <laughs> let's go back to the, to the Upanishads. I want to call them the Oopa Loopas. But... Oopa Loopa. <laughs> the Upanishads. <laughs> well, you know, I, what I want to know, what is their prognosis? What is their their hope for humanity or is there any hope for humanity well of course there is there's always hope for humanity and you know i don't even think the situation is honestly that bad you know i mean i mean if you have a roof over your head and food in your mouth and and you know gas in your car then i mean is it really that bad i think one of the problems is that americans in general they've always had a problem where because of the bankers you know they've always issued out credit to debtors that essentially never had um, you know, they never really had enough, I, I guess, collateral or leverage to even pay off what they what they have. Because if I ask you for a hundred dollars, you know, and you're going to ask, well, what's what's the collateral you have, and just in case you default, and you know, I say I have nothing, then you give me that hundred dollars. It's a risk you're taking that you won't ever get that money back. Right. Without going into a vast amount of details, you know, the 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 one of the problems is that. The bankers swelled this country up with so much pride and so much material wealth artificially, artificially, that the American people for I would say at least 50 to 60 years at very least have essentially, you know, they've always gotten so much more than they put into the system. And that's one, of, you know, and you could thank the bankers for that, for printing out money that had no value because everybody was yeah. kind of living in this fantasy world. Well, what's happening now is they're kind of calling back a lot of those debts and that's what really the um, the bailout was, you know, the bankers essentially wanted some of their money back and it had something to do with the mortgage crisis and this and that, but they just wanted some of their money back and they wanted, the, and since they wanted the money back, then they got the money back because people were so angry, you know, it's like, why am I losing my house and you're paying these people when they're the source of the problem? Well, yes and no. Again, when we go back to contract, there's always, you know, it takes two to tango and we have to be objective about who's really at fault here and why who's really at fault. Because the problem is, is that for at least two generations, the American people have had this uh, almost this addictive fetish to 
taking things which they weren't entitled to, you know, money, yeah. um, <laughs> houses. And now since it's all being retracted back onto, then, you know, most people are going, you know, most people are going through the roof because they don't know how to react to it. And now people are starting to realize that they have no material wealth. They have no leverage. You know, most people have very few to no, no skills in terms of producing for, you know, an economy or for themselves because most people can't really do much of anything. And so I think a lot of people are starting to freak out a little bit because it's like, uh oh, well, those times are over. So what am I going to do now? You know, you mean that, you know, I don't have to just be able to pick up a phone and, you know, I'm getting paid $15 an hour to be a telemarketer. No, it doesn't work anymore. Now you have to actually produce something valuable for society. And I think that's freaking a lot of people out. Um, so, you know, I personally don't think it's that bad. I just think people have to be realistic and understand what, you know, what are what are they entitled to for what they can actually put out, you know. Well, I, th I think you're right, Joe, but I also want to say something is that that is true for us. We, we have it very nice. We have, most mm -hmm. of us in this mm -hmm. country, have roofs over our head and food right. in our bellies, etc. But that is not the case for a great, portion of the world's population they go to bed oh, yeah. hungry they go to right. bed cold they don't have any of the luxuries so we have this marie antoinette let them eat cake syndrome right. the reality is lots of people are suffering right right and it is you know and and there are a tremendous amount of people suffering i, I in the United States, I would say it's a little bit different, you know, and then the, it is a very, it's a very uh, skewed subject because then when we go to like Africa, for example, mm -hmm. you know, then my philosophy is, you know, had, I guess it had the European or, or, or maybe I would even specifically go back to England, had they not went there and tried to do their colonialization and just left the black people alone in their tribal state, they would have been much better off than going in there and devastating their old way of life and then not giving them anything and now they're in you know extreme poverty well of course because you've totally ruined their culture you've ruined their tradition you've ruined their history yeah. and you know and you give them bare necessities because you're hoping that they're going to submit to you due to economic deprivation that's what they're hoping that's how these things work you go in there you promise something better you take what they've you know what's worked for them for hundreds and thousands of years and then you know now 50 years later after we've all forgotten what the actual root cause of the problem was we're saying oh look at the africans you know we're, we we have it so much better well yeah but you know had had white people just never went to africa to begin with then they would have been much better off than we are today and nobody ever bothers to look at that that a lot of the problems that we're having here today is it's not realizing what happened historically you know and it's not realizing um it, it really is it, it honestly is a double-edged sword vivian it's it's because like i said you know the government i think should be protecting the people it should always have the interest of the people but it hasn't it's always had the interest of corporate commercialism mm -hmm. And so, you know, really the government in a lot of respects is even more to blame than the corporations or even the Federal Reserve, for example, because they sold out the people, not the, not the Federal Reserve. They're just doing business and they're not right. good, but mm -hmm. they're the ones, the government is actually the ones that sold out the people in the interest of corporate business. And, you know, and as a result, you fast forward, you know, two, three generations where you get people used to just, you know, virtual reality, Nintendo video games, TV, <laughs> fast food you know, malls, conveniences, getting cars on loans with leverage and collateral that you don't have, then what do you think is going to happen, you know? Um, and I think that's what the government should have came in and stopped it and said, listen, you know, you're giving these people more than they deserve. What are you going to do when you blow the bubble? Well, the government just puts its hands up. The corporations are still taking more and people are just looking confused like they don't know what the hell's going on. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's and that's really the plight of this whole situation. It's multifarious. You know, it's just not one side. It's, you know, like I say, I think it takes two to tango and the people are just as responsible for it. You know, why weren't the people educating themselves? Mm -hmm. You know, why were you in nightclubs instead of reading a book and educating yourself about law, economy, economics, you know? Um, so, you know, and that's what it comes down to, because if you're not going to govern yourself, then, you know, that's like the old adage that somebody will do it for you. Well, yeah, so. I think a lot of it's, it's all fear because people are afraid. Right. They, they are afraid if they know this information, they have it, that they won't know what to do. They won't know right. how to act. It's like right. that, one, that one movie, you can't handle the truth. Right, right, right. And I think a lot of people can't because of the way they've been programmed beforehand. You know, right, I've right. noticed especially, you know, and that's kind of a double-edged sword again is because, you know, the, when you talk to like, when I talk to youth in terms of the teens and the 20s, Mm -hmm. then they have the ability to understand it, but because they don't have enough life experience yet to really appreciate what you're saying, it doesn't stick. Right. And then when you talk to people in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, then I think 
for them to swallow what you're saying, it would be too painful to realize that you really don't own your home. You know, it's actually illegal to own your home. You don't really own your car. You're basically going to slave your entire life away just to live, you know, for the average person, you know, that does the whole uh, rat race and nine to five thing. You're basically going to slave your entire life away just to have a mediocre existence. And, you know, all your money is going to a queen that you don't really support and to a government you don't really support. And so rather than admit that, I think it's better just to deny it as a conspiracy for most people, you know. Yeah, and play the game. Um, I think you're right on, too, exactly. Yeah, yeah um, and, it, and it is. But, you know, again, we're going to come into some interesting times because as the economic situation will get categorically worse, people losing their homes, people getting homeless, then I think a lot of people will be like, hey, you know, what the hell, might as well look at this information and it'll just awaken more people. So, you know, there is, you know, everything is a curse and a blessing at the same stroke. And, you know, even though we're going through bad times, I guess, uh, materially right now, there's always that potential that people will start looking inward, you know, spiritually and intellectually and, and see what the hell's really going on. So, it's just a matter of how you approach it. That's why, you know, I said, I don't think we live in bad times. I think we live in good times. I just, I think if you're used to getting things which weren't entitled to you to begin with, then yeah, we're living in bad times. But, you know, if, if you just open your eyes a little bit and you have the, the will to want to learn, we're, you know, when we're in phenomenal times, think of the internet. You know, you're old enough to remember mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> land before in the internet. And, sure. you know, just think how much that revolutionized information. I mean, you, you could do things that were, just weren't possible 10, 20 years ago. I'm old enough to remember eight tracks. Nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I'm really dating myself. We're getting that sign. It's nice. time for a commercial. Okay. So we're going to come back and we're going to talk about how to contact you. We okay. ha I think we need to do about uh, 10 hours, but uh, Wait, there's anyway. not really enough time. We can do a so, part two if you guys want. I'm, I think um, we're going to need to. Yeah, definitely. Oh. So stay tuned. We'll be back in just a minute with our visit with Joe Do Lachal of the Pyramid Center. Of the Pyramid Center. <laughs> BPN, join the awakening. The Broad Perspective Network is a portal designed to reveal a new perspective and reality to those who wish to know the truth about the world we live in and our role in it. BPN, see beyond the illusion. Welcome back to The Broad Perspective. Here on The Broad Perspective Network, I'm Vivian Kamori. And I'm Katie Curley Nelson. And we're visiting with Joe Dolashal of the Pyramid Center. Nice. And we do want to give some contact information before I forget, Joe. So folks that have questions, what would they do? They could, um, they could go to the website to check out what's going on with the Pyramid Center, which I'm guessing we'll delve into a little bit here at uh, thepyramidcenter.org. That's the pyramidcenter.org and uh, you could reach me directly if you'd like at uh, joe j-o-e at the pyramidcenter.org that's j-o-e joe at the pyramidcenter.org okay cool now tell us what the pyramid center is all about i've seen pictures it's like gonna be so awesome Nice. No, <laughs> so, um, what it essentially is, is, you know, amongst, I guess, during the times of uh, studying, you know, what I was studying the, these all these years, then I came to the conclusion that I think what would need to happen for people is, you know, there's that theoretical aspect, which, of course, we all deal with, but then there's that um, spiritual aspect that one kind of needs to be in a position, physically in a position, where they can extricate themselves, at least for a brief moment, from the whole matrix, the paradigm of what's going on right now in the world, and better than themselves and kind of reflect in on themselves spiritually. And so I've had this idea for a very long time. I've been uh, very fortunate to actually get a, a gift, a donation, if you will, from an old lady that's now passed away. And she gave me this property over here in the San Bernardino Mountains, which for some of your listeners, I don't know how far or wide they are, but San Bernardino is essentially in Southern California, right next to Los Angeles. And I got about 237 acres up there. Oh, wow. Where yeah, it's, it's a pretty big parcel, and it's smack dab out in the middle of nowhere, which is perfect. Um, it's about 100 miles from Los Angeles, east of Los Angeles, and what it essentially, it's absolutely surrounded um, by national forestry, so you're literally in the middle of nowhere. Um, and what I wanted to recreate was essentially a type of ancient Alexandria, where it was a type of spiritual, intellectual nexus where people can come to go and meditate, to reflect on themselves, uh, read books if they want to be just left alone, if they want to go in there in groups and do certain types of chakra healing or sound healing or experiment in any kind of alternative healing 
uh, therapy, whether it be physical, mental, or spiritual, then that's the place you would go and do it. Um, and I actually did for your listeners, if they kind of want to get a little bit more on that, I did a video. If you go on YouTube, it's called the Pyramid Center promo video. If you just uh, YouTube search that uh, phrase, the Pyramid Center promo video, then um, then you'll see I just did actually like a 10, 11 minute segment with some friends on that stuff that a guy actually came down uh, from Canada and we filmed that together. Just kind of it gives you the who, what, when, why of the center, you know. Yeah, I can. I've seen that. I've seen that video, mm-hmm. and it's it's beautiful. It's stunning, and your vision is equally as stunning. I'm right. very excited about what it is and what you're doing. I think it'll be phenomenal. Can't now, wait. are you actually putting a pyramid in there? Yeah, there will actually okay. be a pyramid on top of the apex of one of the mountains that we have there. There'll be a 50 by 50 base and a 30 foot high pyramid there. And you know, one of the major problems I'm having right now, it's uh, you know, I put a lot of money into it already, but I'm having issues trying to get water up there. You know, I try to uh-huh. drill for water. And, um, you know, it didn't work out for whatever number of reasons. And so I'm really, really struggling to get water up there. But um, other than that, you know, I've already developed a, a prototype bungalow. I already have a one kilowatt system hooked up there. And we got roads and hiking trails and all that stuff. So even for the uh, more adventurous type, you could definitely go up there now and camp out and hang out. I'm going to have to put on my thinking cap. I know some people that deal with water, water mm. witching and nice and uh, well. So I'll have to put on my thinking cap. Thinking cap. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So uh, what's your timeline on that? When do you expect that well, to be ready for folks? It's, you know, it's honestly with the water situation, that's the one thing that's been mm-hmm. holding me back. I've been working on the project, putting money into the project for about five years now. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm kind of trying to figure out what route I should take if I wanted to look for investors, if I wanted to try to branch out a little bit more and get funds from other people rather than just going with myself because I've been funding it entirely out of my own pocket thus far. Wow. Um, so with in terms of a timeline, you know, the, with the pyramid standing, I wouldn't say any longer than two years, but it, probably not any sooner than six to, eight, six to nine months. So somewhere within that uh, timeline. But like I said, you know, I mean, even for individuals who don't really care about the pyramid, but they just love the outdoors and even for mm-hmm. meditative purposes, it's, it's ready to rock and roll now. So you can just go up there on your own, or do they have to go through um, you to go usually, in Usually, yeah, they have to go through me. I put a gate up there because uh, I actually had a um, some, some, some equipment stolen from me, unfortunately. Oh, no. Uh, yeah, so I put a gate up there now. But even if it wasn't for that, then it's you, you do have to have a 4x4 four four to get there. You won't get there without a 4x4 four four vehicle. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a lifted truck. I, I go up there with these uh, older Suzuki sidekicks. See, they're just uh-huh. like these little old banger cars. You know, They're just kind of like probably, I don't know, the equivalent of like a Kia Soul or something. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Our son yeah, Joe had a so. Suzuki sidekick. Yeah, there you go. You know who they are. <laughs> <laughs> yep, sure do. So, um, so, yeah, that's what I go up there with, and it's plenty enough. You just have to have something that's a little lifted, you know, because of the terrain, because it's a dirt road to go out there for 15 miles. But, um, yeah, you know, I'm always going up there, so it's not an issue. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. I think that's way awesome. Yeah. So are you going to have a library up there with all I kinds will. of Upanishad library. stuff? Yeah. yeah, well, amongst many other things, yeah, the Upanishads <laughs> and um, a library just of general occult mysticism. You know, I'll have a lot of reprints for people of rare books because I, I was actually heavily, not so much now, but heavily into collecting very old literature for the longest time. You know, just, mm-hmm. you know, like um, English history, you know, that was printed in the 17th century and just, mm-hmm. you know, really off the wall stuff, but nonetheless very interesting. I think wow. that's fascinating. Mm-hmm. And I know you're starting the video library on YouTube. I think you're putting a lot of very insightful things up there for people to watch. They're, they're short. I think people can sit down for less than 10 minutes and right. get some great right. insights. Right. It is. It's, yeah, it's kind of like the Cliff's Notes version. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. but it's but for for those of us in this busy world, this crazy world, sometimes ten minutes is all the time it's, we have. Exactly, exactly, right. Rather than <laughs> yeah. people having to devote two and a half hours to a documentary or something. Right. right? No, I re- I really mean that. Those right. those short little things are great. They are. Well, yeah. One of my favorites was when you um, go through the origins of the word God. Maybe you can get into that just briefly. Yeah, when um, the the word God, you know, when when you look into etymology and even like, and this goes back to the Upanishads, which we'll cover next time, hopefully, um, <laughs> then it's um, then you know they talk basically God. What it, God says, it, it means a principle in vogue, basically meaning that. Within the you, you know within the universe today we understand everything is kind of chemical action reaction, but. Um, 
during the times when we see like what a god means and even that you know when you go back to the bible then you know moses picks one god out of many gods so it's like well well obviously there's many gods there's just not one god there's one absolute which means behind all the principles behind all the certain principle cause and effects of things and there's one absolute behind it but otherwise in terms of functionality the universe presents us with an x amount of gods and many gods actually um some speculate that there's you know 33 some speculate that there's 333 some say that there's 10,000 of them some say it's it's a you know, that's in itself as a subject, but um, the word God, when you look it up in terms of like even the Oxford Dictionary, the etymology, where does that word come from? It just means a principle invoked, meaning that, you know, through the meditative or prayer process that you actually become in tune with a specific principle out of a, a vast amount of principles that these principles would grant you certain things. And that's even goes back to astrology that the principle of Jupiter is the principle of favorability, propitiousness, of money, of expansion, of luck. Um, you know, the principle of Saturn would be, you know, the principle of wisdom, intelligence, discipline, restriction, and the principle of Mars is passion, um, fighting, anger, or even, you know, any, anything like that. The principle of Venus would be, you know, lust, sex, beauty, women, that kind of stuff. So, I mean, just, you know, there's many, many gods. There's not just one god, you know. Um, so, yeah, that's that's an interesting subject in itself, which I did a little, I guess, little... 10 minute cliffs notes on YouTube uh, entitled was a curious consciousness uh, I right. think it's just called God I think right I think so yeah, yeah I the that. last one I just saw was on aliens oh yeah that was a good one too and we yeah. don't even have time for that we're going to we're, we're going to have to talk I think you have a lot of subject matter that would be good for our listeners <laughs> that they, uh -huh. would, they would love to follow yeah, up yeah yeah we could do, definitely do another one again if you guys yeah know. yeah most definitely especially now that we're figuring out the technology <laughs> that, we, that, that all of us can communicate on uh huh I think, well, okay, so l just on the one final thing with the Upanishads, because I know some of our listeners are, are going to want to take some meat home. If there was one message above everything else that these texts are trying to relay to us in, in one or two sentences, what would that be? Um, the truth is within yourself. Don't look for it out there. And everything is just a matter of perception. There's no good or bad. I would tell people just to educate yourself intellectually and spiritually. Okay. That's you know, yeah. The perfect. truth is not the truth is not out there as they say, it's within yourself, you know. It's subjective, isn't it? No, it's your subjective. Truth. It's it's subjective to a certain degree, but that's what you know. That's that's one of the things that are an interesting aspect about spirituality is a lot of it is mind based, subjective, of course. But then you start surpassing it because what happens is the spiritual practice becomes truly spiritual in that respect, and it's no longer about theory. And that's kind of what I was even saying a little bit beforehand. Um, you know that to describe even the the creation process as the Upanishads describe it, it's a very it's it's almost an intuitive abstraction. It's not so much that the words can even understand your imagination because it's not a mind based thing. You know, like if I was to ask you, uh, Vivian, can you explain to me what intuition is? Then you would say, oh, it's when you know. You might say something like, oh, it's when you know you just understand something. You know, okay, but what, what does that mean? You know, and obviously somebody who's never experienced intuition firsthand on several occasions really doesn't know what that means. Right. And, and that's that process which, you know, spirituality even, you know, starts delving into where you have some of these easier um, aphorisms, as you were, um, that don't really mean much to anybody who has an experience that even like seek and you right. shall find, you know, it's like, well, that sounds very novel, but unless you've been through a process in your life where you've, you know, really wanted something and then you found it through just a series of apparently unrelated um, events, then you're like, wow, you know, there really is something to the universe and the fact that my mind's connected to everything and somehow, you know, God or my intuition or my subconscious led me this way. And so, you know, it, it, is it subjective? Yes, but you know, at the same token, everything in the world is 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 subjective, you know. But then there's <laughs> yeah. there's things there's things that are just far far beyond subjective, which is truly the spiritual pursuit, which you know the individual through uh, certain protracted efforts via meditation will have to just come to their own conclusion. It's not easy, but I think it's the only thing truly worthwhile in this world, you know, because even money, even all that stuff, it has a certain limitation. It's fun for a while, but then it loses its luster. And you know, I think it all. Even these types of things, like when people try to be famous or they try to go for money or they try certain successes or they want families, that's really just a physical expression and externalization of something you're trying to seek within yourself. Right. Um, and so that's why, you know, the meditative process kind of goes beyond it, it. It tries to bypass the physical and just say, why don't you try to experience it within the heart, not the physical heart. We're talking about something completely different here. You know, the, the spiritual heart. 
the spiritual heart exactly why don't you try to experience it within and try to you know try to figure out why it is you're trying to do what you're trying to do it's uh it gets you know we'll try to dabble in that a little bit more when we get into the upanishads because that starts getting a little bit more into that subject and it really you know true spirituality just it's simply there's you know words can only describe so much you know they have when you start getting into things like these types of abstractions and meditations and you know when we start even getting into like psychic phenomenon with the electromagnetic force and uh, higher spiritual realms you know words almost don't do anything they're basically we're just putting uh, you know we're just trying to describe the indescribable essentially and so um, you know, or it has it's to be more of an experience. Exactly. It has to be an experience, you know, and that's it. You know, and the individual just has to, you know, have faith, hope and, and do their um, meditative meditative sessions and then, you know, according to the to the to the efforts that they put into that, then as they say that God gives you boons, you know. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. When you were talking about the electromagnetic fields, that's gonna be something for a whole nother show as well. Yeah. Because what crossed my mind as you were talking about building this pyramid center and the pyramid there, are you familiar with the Coral Castle? Oh, of course, yeah. Yeah, of course. Well, that's something about using the electromagnetic right. fields. Right. And understanding that, you'd have that pyramid done overnight. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, and he, he must have known something. That's a very interesting story in itself. You know, he, he, did. he did know something. Yeah, and, and he even said that he knew the secrets of the ancient pharaohs, and he was just absolutely reluctant to disclose it to anybody. He just said that the human race is simply too young to know certain types of powers. And I tend to agree with him entirely. If I knew certain powers, I wouldn't give it to people because the human race, I mean, you know, if we had to base it on credit alone, then there's, you know, savage yeah. animals to say the least. Look what yeah. they've done with the internet already. <laughs> right. Well, the internet, you know, that again, that's a completely different discussion. But the internet, the entire basis of the internet was to be, I, I think, was to introduce people into a virtual, uh, technological-based society because that was a uh, Department of Defense operation since the 1940s. You know, right. all the way. Right. So, so the internet, again, you know, one of those things they pawn off as a convenience, and then they restrict it and control it through, like credit cards. You know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, clearly, we have a lot more to talk about. So, mm-hmm. Joe, you've you've got to come back. We're out of. We'll time for this week's show we're so grateful for your time today and we'll announce to our listeners when you're coming back sounds good uh, yes because we do need more time together we want to remind everybody to go to the pyramid yep and check it out you can go to youtube and google lots of joe's things his his shows his presentations his his presentations thank you outstanding thank you joe thank you we appreciate it have a great weekend all right same to you thanks